a vertical shaft. Columns are most frequently used in row, supporting a horizontal lintel, a colonnade, or with a series of arches, an arcade. But they may also be used on their own, perhaps to support a statue. They are often round, may be square or polygonal. The transition between the column and the floor is usually aided by a base and that with the wall above by a capital. Both bases and capitals spread the load, making the column more stable. They also provide a visual transition point between vertical and horizontal. We have some nice illustrations. This one is a commemorative column. Romans used freestanding columns to commemorate great men and heroic deeds. There are several that you can still see in Rome today. Um, some, one of them is in the Forum. Trajan's column in Rome. So I think this one. about 112 AD or CE commemorates the Roman Emperor's victory over the Dacians. The form reappeared during the neoclassical period for monuments like Nelson's Column in London and the July Column in Paris's Place de la Bastille. And we shouldn't forget the victory column in Berlin, with the golden winged victory atop. Columns 
arms often look as if they are made of a single long stone. But in fact, most are constructed from large segments or drums. Here you can see the segments. in sections. Here's one that's been cut into. Plasters are tall, flat strips with capitals and bases that are attached to the wall. So not a freestanding of columns, but they are performing no structural function. Here at the temple of Bacchus at Baalbek in Lebanon, 2nd century CE, they are used with an entablature, but they can also be used with arches. some arches that doesn't go down all the way. A corbel is a capital that is fixed to the wall and used without an underlying column. In the Romanesque and Gothic periods, corbels were used to provide support for roofs and vaults, arches and statues. This Scottish corbel from Melrose Abbey supports a small colonnade that is part of a vault respond. It's very decorated as well. The volute, the projecting knobs on the upper on the upper cornets of the same capitals are called volutes. So we have the pillar here and the volutes there. They help to make the transition between the pier and the wall above. Volutes were often carved as curling fo foliage, but more stylized shapes, including grotesque heads, were also used, as here in this renaissance capital. There you can see the leaves and little ornamentation near these scrolls and the capital just above it and the more structural Classical orders. The design and proportion of columns in ancient Greece and Rome were governed by a set of rules known as the orders. There are five main orders Doric, Tuscan, Ionic. discovered during the Renaissance.
Renaissance and were codified by Leon Battista Alberti in his 1452 treatise De Re Edificatoria on the art of building. One of the key theoretical texts of the Renaissance. Each order was considered to have particular characteristics, making them suitable for certain types of buildings. The relatively plain Doric order, for instance, was associated with strength, while the Corinthian order deemed to be particularly beautiful. You can easily recognize the Doric order by its frieze with alternating plain or sculptured metopes and grooved triglyphs. The triglyphs represent the stylized beam ends of a timber roof. The capitals are very simple and some early examples of the Greek Doric order have no base. This one has a bit of a base there. square, very strong and sturdy. The Tuscan order, a mainly Italian type, is not dissimilar to the Doric order, but the frieze is plain and the capitals are a little more complex with convex astragal mouldings. There, it's curving outward. This order was popular in the Renaissance, and a large-scale version of the Tuscan is called the Gigantic Order. Very monumental. distinguish the Ionic order by its characteristic scrolled capitals, which are said to look like a rolled up pillow. The fronts and sides are different, unlike the other orders. It's not the same all the way around. The columns are usually fluted. And the frieze may be plain or decorated with sculpted ornaments. There's a frieze there. This one has some beautiful plants and leaves sculpted into it. The Corinthian order has capitals covered in rows of acanthus. A very beautiful leaf, with those at the corners curling over to become volutes. Phew, phew, phew. They are both Greek and Roman versions. The shaft of a Greek Corinthian column is usually fluted, while that of the Roman version is plain. These are the most ornate ones. the transverse it's holding there. Composite. The composite order is a particularly Roman invention and it is the richest and most elaborate of the orders. This order is a cross between the Corinthian and the Ionic. acanthus leaves and scrolls. The phrase and entablature of this order are also richly embellished with relief sculpture. So we have a lot going on here. Some story and relief there. Even 
some architectural embellishments up here. Every level has something happening. And the leaves there, and the scroll. Very elaborate one. What happens to these pillar capitals as time goes by? After the classical world, we have examples of early Christian architecture. Large numbers of new churches were constructed when Christianity became the official religion of the Roman Empire in 326 CE. Most followed the Isle Basilica plan, derived from a Roman civic building, and thus had internal arcades supported on columns. Initially, early Christian capital and column forms were much like their Roman predecessors, but new capital forms that reflected Christian iconography and symbolism were developed as the Roman Empire eventually disintegrated under increasing pressure from barbarian invasion, shifting its political focus eastward, new architectural influences from the east became more prominent, and Byzantine architectural forms developed in wholly new and highly distinctive ways. curvy one, and it's very highly decorated. The 
this is a fold capital. This capital from St. Sergius and Bacchus, Constantinople, now known as Istanbul, looks as if it has been made from a piece of fabric. Because it's got the folds there like that, like a handkerchief. to be gathered into folds by the column. Known as a fold capital, its textile-like pattern of foliage that intertwines with the guillotine pattern or lacework further enhances this fabric-like effect. shafts ornamented with 
with geometric patterns like these are a clear clue to the Romanesque period. Spirals and zigzags were especially popular and may have been related to spiral columns that were used at Old St. Peter's in Rome. But there was no sense that sets of columns were needed to match. Look at that design. There's some figures carved right into the column here. Column figures, especially in French and Spanish Romanesque architecture. The columns that decorated door jams were frequently anthropomorphized or shown in human form as sculpted figures of saints and biblical figures. These figures from Santiago de Compostela Cathedral in Spain depict Old Testament prophets with scrolls. There you can see the bend there and the spiral with some foliage carved in. Standards of building and carving techniques improved enormously during the Gothic period compared to the earlier Romanesque period. And as a consequence, Gothic architecture is much lighter and more delicate than Romanesque. This is particularly apparent in the carving of columns and capitals. Naturalistic foliage was very popular for capitals, and foliage predominates in the early part of the period. Columns were often created to look as if they had been made from bundles of small shafts. During the late Gothic period, capitals became extremely small and were often little more than mouldings, thus emphasizing the vertical aspect of the building. Gothic architecture is also marked by the advent of the pointed arch, allowing the height of the support to be raised, making higher windows, higher ceilings, higher arches, and allowing more light to come in. So it's a very dreamy, floaty style, causing one to look up and above. Look at all of the filigree and little foliage. This is the rich ornamentation of Gothic. Early Gothic capitals such as this century group but they can be seen in Lincoln Cathedral were often richly ornamented with a combination of naturalistic foliage, bold moldings and geometric shapes like the so-called dog tooth or four petal flowers used here. The use of dark marble for the smaller shafts adds an extra dimension of richness. So the Purebeck marble will be set in to what looks or is made to look like smaller columns all coming together in this one architectural support. So the eye thinks it's looking at many small things, when architecturally it's one support. This column from the 13th century Gothic cathedral in Salisbury has a round central core surrounded by four detached shafts. 
has been removed. 
replaced with foliage trails. Renaissance architects experimented with new forms that built on classical ideas. One was the banded column, in which alternate blocks were larger and rusticated, created by the French royal architect Philibert de Lorme. Between 1510 and 1517, he said to have lived and these banded columns were important in later Renaissance and Baroque architecture. There you can see these strange bands that look more structural than beautiful, but they lend a certain atmosphere of power and strength So perhaps the idea behind the design. Look at these beautiful Rococo examples here. Baroque architects used columns as decoration as much as structural elements. The columns on the facade of the Church of St. Paul and St. Louis in Paris, for instance, rest improbably on a pediment, but they add greatly to the very rich decorative effect, along with the elaborate surface ornament. Look at all that elaborate stonework there. This one is a Rococo capital. Rococo architects designed new forms of capitals with light decoration that suited the delicacy of the Rococo style. This capital, which is almost cylindrical in shape, has little to do with the Corinthian order on which it is nominally based. But that does not detract from its decorative potential. Look at that. There are figures carved in there. Some kind of nymph, as well as the acanthus leaves, and even more frieze at the top, and a fluted bowl. era to the Baroque. Let's have a look again at our classical orders and put them into our notebook. Let's use some scissors. some glue, glue stick.
sculpted. Hopes and a stylized beam. It doesn't say anything about the skull, but but that appears to be indicative or possibly elemental. So what? are convex. So we have our convex molding there, also called the oops, gigantic order.
see this one's got a little curve in it going down and some more frieze decoration underneath fluted column was assumed for many years that these architectural elements and even statues had been very bland and the color of the white marble but it was discovered 
as the acanthus leaves and the ionic scrolls and lots of embellishment there. It's a composite. This one's Roman invention. And most elaborate of the orders. It is Corinthian and Ionic. It has acanthus leaves and scroll. order. Are you nice and relaxed now? And architecturally inspired? Thank you for spending some time in the study with me today. I really enjoyed it. yourself.